shocking and infuriating. A long-awaited police meeting was held recently with Justin Evans' family. And you might be throwing some F-bombs by the end of this video. There were major pieces that were missed by the OPP, specifically about Justin's phone. And the ball was more than just dropped, not just in the beginning, but throughout the investigation. So it brings up even more questions. And the OPP are the ones with the case file. And yet, they didn't do their due diligence. That's a fact. The question is, why? So, let's get into it. First things first, Justin Evans' case is still an open investigation. But according to Detective Inspector Matt Watson, there's no sufficient evidence to classify this as a homicide. Now, this meeting was supposed to occur back in September, but Jamie, Justin's mom, was ignored. She was waiting for the phone to ring. It didn't. September went by. October went by. She did get a phone call saying it's going to be soon. November went by. December and January. And then they finally had a meeting. Now, coincidentally, this was after I released my video on Ken McKinney and the OPP. You can check that out in the description below or at the end of this video. Let's start with the search. Justin went missing in December of 2020. He was found five months later in May of 2020, 1,000 feet from his home in a nearby swamp. How did investigators, or anyone living in that trailer park for that matter, not find Justin in those five months he was missing? People frequently visit that water and visit that pond. And in fact, a person who was walking that area found Justin. But investigators are now admitting that now they didn't search the water. And first they said they did, and then they didn't. And now they're sticking with they didn't, and even that's foggy. When the investigation first started, they found a shed full of blood. It was Justin's blood. And the family were told that it would be unsurvivable. But later, they said, well, maybe it was survivable and that Justin likely walked into the swamp even though there wasn't a blood trail, witnesses, or any evidence that he did. Not to mention, there was no blood on the door handle. Now, in a previous video, I showed that it would have taken 15 minutes to walk to the swamp while delirious, as they said, losing an estimation of 50% of blood. It's not scientifically possible. And no matter how Justin ended up in that swamp, if he was there from the beginning and the authorities searched that swamp, then at the very least, he would have been found right away and not put the family through the hell that they endured since his death. But they didn't. A simple search of that area where a missing person was reported should be normal. Yet that didn't happen. Why? Matt Watson claims that the swamp was frozen over and he says he has pictures to prove it. And that's why they didn't go and search it. He also said he had a helicopter in the air. But Jamie said the first cold day and blizzard happened on the Monday, the day that Justin was reported missing. And I pulled the weather up from the month before Justin was missing right up to the day he was. And it's not possible that that swamp was frozen before he went missing. And it doesn't take one minute to freeze like it's some Frozen 2 movie. On Monday the 14th is when Justin was reported missing and when the blizzard happened. And then it started to freeze. So if they search for Justin Monday night or Tuesday, the swamp would not have been frozen over. And technically, they'd find Justin. Another detective said that he did search the swamp, but not on the side that Justin was found. Because in his mind, he said he didn't know he could access it. I don't know, maybe there's a map. You're a detective. So which is it? You did search the swamp, you didn't search the swamp. Matt Watson believes that Justin went into the swamp, got in the water, and it froze over. And time is of the essence, especially with a missing person, wouldn't you agree? Stick a heck yeah below. So Matt tells the family, we want to do better next time. What next time? Matt explains the swamp iced over. They, get, they gave a little bit of consideration to the ice, wondering if Justin could be in there, but they decided to focus on a 70-year-old man who would you know, do something solely. Ken McKinney, who's in his 70s, lied to the cops about his whereabouts. The authorities didn't believe that a 74-year-old man can carry Justin, who is six foot four and 200 plus pounds, into the swamp. And he's not wrong. However, very few people could carry Justin alone, especially when they're deceased. Well, except for maybe somebody like The Rock. 
Now, I've mentioned this before in numerous videos that you would probably need two to three people helping. It's not easy. So here's what this means. Matt didn't believe Ken could carry Justin and put zero thought into thinking that maybe, just maybe, he had help. And maybe people close to Ken helped him. But they believe that there's no evidence that anyone helped him. Keep watching because I'll be touching on this statement later on in this video. Ken lied about his whereabouts. He said he went shopping in Barrie, Ontario on Saturday, two days before Justin was reported missing. He said he was on a four-day bender, that's why he lied, but in court it was released, he was actually driving Kiara's car at noon on Saturday. Odd, right? Authorities charged Ken with obstruction of justice. And in the beginning, they brought in Ken, they brought in Glenna, and the kids, as Matt Watson called it. And one of the kids, Bud McKinney, Ken's biological grandson, but adopted son, told the authorities that Ken asked him to lie, but when Jamie arrived on scene on the Monday, Bud told Jamie that Ken was with him that day, and he told another family member of Justin's that Ken was with Bud that day as well. But why lie, right? So authorities then honed in on Ken, because he's a liar, and investigated it fully. But Matt said that Ken doesn't have a history of serious violent activity and the fact that he's a 74 year old man, he's an alcoholic and he has a bad back. But he does have a history of violence and he was even in jail for assault. Now it was years later, but not many people change their stripes. Some do when they acknowledge there's a problem, but some don't. And just before Justin died, he was in the trailer breaking up Bud and Ken who were duking it out. Ken was bleeding and Bud was going to punch Justin. Justin called him out on it and he backed down. Justin wanted to call 911 because Ken was bleeding. They didn't want to call 911 because they didn't want Bud to get in trouble. Now back to the search. There were dogs during that search. Dogs hit on one other spot outside that shed. So one of the theories was that Justin was moved from the shed to a vehicle, and that was one of the reasons why the authorities didn't check the swamp. But if you think about it in any missing persons case, even if you think a person was taken by a car, they would still investigate. You investigate the surroundings from where they were last seen. And just because you leave a car doesn't mean you won't end up two, three minutes down the road right? So the focus, according to the authorities, is on Saturday. And as I said before, that's alibi day. But what I've proven is that Justin was likely killed on Friday, not Saturday. And even though Ken lied to the authorities and the whole household has discrepancies everywhere, they are basing that as fact because that's when Justin was last seen and his last text message. But that's according to the household who's known to lie. The only other people other than the household who saw Justin last was on Wednesday at work. But even in that meeting with the detectives, they told the family that the last Bud saw Justin was Friday. Yet we see that the kids posted a month later that they saw Justin on Saturday morning at the shed. And that wasn't said initially. And one of the detectives believes that Bud last saw Justin on Friday. So why are we looking at Saturday and not Friday? And side note, for some reason, there is an abnormal protection of Bud, apparently in this meeting. And I find that odd. Not just, hey, this kid has told the truth to me about Ken, but overly protective. Why? As for Bud, he waited to call the cops. They took pictures of the blood riddled shed. They spread the photos around. They lied to the family. And let's talk about his picture with him and his girlfriend Kiara wearing his dead friend's sunglasses months after his death. My question is, where did he take it from? His room, 
He didn't ask Justin's family if he could have the sunglasses, and the family went that same week to collect Justin's belongings, and he told the family that he bought the sunglasses from Justin, which was a lie. And then the story from Kiera was Justin gave them to him. So which one is it? And the location where the picture was taken was an empty lot near the home. And when Kiara was asked where that location was, she didn't want to say where it was located because she said if Justin was found, then it's tag you're it. She said this two and a half weeks before he was found. Now, no one in the household remembers what they were doing the week before Justin died, except full details on Saturday. In fact, Kara was asked what she did on Friday, and this is her response. Friday, Friday, Friday. Um, I think we didn't do too much. I think we just hung at home. Um, yeah, just watch movies and stuff. And then when she was asked, did you see Justin on the Thursday or the Friday? Her response is, I didn't, I probably, okay, this is hard because Justin and I don't talk. I don't want to bring that up too much, but we didn't talk, so we didn't hang out. Um, I probably did see him go to the bathroom, see him with the door open, hanging out in his room or something, but I can't say I did physically see him, but I do know for sure that Bud gave him a 535, so. And the detectives wonder how it would change the investigation if they looked at Friday instead of Saturday. Um, what? And this is where it gets interesting too because I was told that Matt told the family that there wasn't anything inconsistent with Bud and that he was his best friend. And in any investigation, that sounds like the oddest reason, right? Well, he was his best friend, so therefore, I mean, I could see that coming from a family member or a friend, you know, but not a detective. That's like saying in another case, like, he was her husband, so... He's not gonna do anything. It's your job to figure it out as a detective, regardless if a person is married or a best friend or what have you, a stranger. If you check out my Heidi Broussard case, this was a case where Heidi had a best friend who ended up killing her and stealing her baby. And speaking about Friday, Justin had some Google searches for his family's doctor, phone number, and some physical pain, let's say, that he was experiencing. So why would you look up a doctor for help if you're gonna kill yourself, right? I think we know that answer, but the authorities don't. Now let's get into the neighbors. Lucas was discussed as well as Sarah. They're both neighbors. The shed is in the middle, pretty much, and Lucas and Sarah are in the point of view. Lucas died in the beginning of January, three weeks after Justin. And it's said that he was killed by a train and that he died from suicide. It's also said that Lucas left a recording claiming partial responsibility for Justin's death. However, the authorities don't believe Lucas was involved. Forensics came back and doesn't connect Lucas. Lucas doesn't have any prior um, violence or mental health issues or anything like that from what they're told. However, Jamie was told months ago, the same time that they were trying to claim Justin committed suicide and in the same breath said Lucas may be responsible. But Jamie was told that Lucas left something on the recording that said, there's a monster inside me, a darkness took over, and I'm gonna end it before anyone gets hurt. When I heard that, I immediately went through some of my screenshots that I had, and it was actually made years ago by Bud McKinney, on his Facebook and look what it said. We stopped checking for monsters under bed when we realized they were inside us. Sound familiar? Here's another picture, it has razor blades. And another picture, is your joke still funny with a wrist cut? Weird, right? Now Justin was said by authorities to have slit his wrists, even though from the coroner report, he did not hit his arteries, but his wrist was cut. There was not only one cut, but there was two. And they're the same exact size. A weapon was found near Justin. It was an X-Acto knife within six feet of where Justin laid. Now, Justin owned various pocket knives. It's interesting he would choose an X-Acto knife. And from what I read from the autopsy report, it was found a day after Justin was found. I would have assumed in the past that it would have been cordoned off after Justin was found, but now I, I just don't trust that it was until 
the family's shown that it was. What are your thoughts? I'm also questioning if Lucas even died from suicide because more and more isn't adding up. And back to social media, the authorities also mentioned that Kiera's statements on social media didn't match what she told them. Gee, I wonder why. Sarah was the other neighbor. She knew Justin and from the sounds of it, her father knew him better than Sarah did. We heard in the past that Justin invited Sarah over on Friday night, but he didn't show up. So her place is in the line of sight of the shed, just like Lucas. Interesting tidbit. After Justin went missing, or I should say after Justin was reported missing, Kiera and Bud went to the neighbor's house to ask if they saw Justin. They didn't go anywhere else, just at Lucas's house and at Sarah's house. And one of the things that was interesting is quite some time later, Bud told the family that there were tracks back and forth from Lucas's trailer to the shed. It almost suggests that it's Lucas, and I don't know if it was or not. However, it snowed on Monday. It didn't snow the days before. It was Monday that there was a blizzard. And so of course, there's going to be back and forth tracks, especially since they went to Lucas's to ask him if they saw Justin, right? Now, Sarah was known to make posts and videos after Justin went missing. She was saying that she was fighting for her friend. She was seen crying, but there was some odd posts as well. There was a post of having visions of where Justin would be located. And months before, there was also a map that I saw, and I believe it was January, of where to find him. And Justin's family was told that the OPP would follow up on every tip. So if they followed up on that tip, then they would have found Justin. And the family trusted the OPP to follow up on the tip. Now, I have said this before, and it might have been in a live stream, but there was a call that went in, I know that for a fact, of some sketchy behavior from the household. And it wasn't followed up. In fact, the phone call wasn't even returned about this tip. Why? When the investigators cordoned off the house, which is shortly after he was reported missing, they went through Justin's bedroom and the trailer. Justin's brand new phone was not found and that still to this day remains missing. But Justin's family found another phone when they went through his bedroom after the authorities were done the search. But it was an old phone and it was between the wall and the bed. So either authorities didn't search hard enough in the room or was it planted? In previous videos, I proved that Justin's phone would have had to be plugged in in order for it not to shut down. And it stayed at the same spot since Wednesday. And Sunday morning, it went dead. Therefore, somebody had to have unplugged it from that house and got rid of it. Justin's Audible was also playing continuously on his phone from Friday as well, all the way through the weekend. So did the cops not search well enough? Or did someone in that house plant it? After knowing that the family is coming over and they'd be asking questions. Here's where it gets from bad to worse. The detectives, who we think are investigating the case, had no clue about the Audible account or the Google searches or the GPS. None. Matt says it's the first he's ever heard about it. Ask yourself why that is. I am certainly flabbergasted. The family sent all of this information to their liaison way back in summer. Only the liaison stopped returning their phone calls after their last contact on August 17th. Not a peep. The family didn't know why. No one was updating the family anymore. They didn't even know that she's been taken off the case. So a pile of information that could lead to Justin's murderer is right there at their fingertips and they don't have a clue in a car load about it. I did the work on it, so you figure it out. You don't even need to figure it out, just watch my video. Check that out here. Now, the family also brought up the GPS and the coordinates 
of Justin's phone. And the detective said it might not be accurate because it pings off the towers. Well, if you've had that information, you would know that it is accurate because not only does it give the coordinates, but it also shows the coordinates a week before when Justin was going to work and back and those were correct. Let me know how angry you are about that information. That drives me bonkers. There's some half good news. Justin's earbud was found in the shed, one of them. And I'd love to know though which day it was because that makes a difference. There's also questions why a motorcycle wasn't taken out of the shed and investigated. Investigators said, yes, we did look at that. And the family says, no, you didn't. There was blood on the motorcycle. And unless you put it in the exact perfect same spot, no, you didn't. And here's another interesting fact. Ken was their number one suspect in the beginning because of his lies, etc. So why would the detectives give the keys to a locked shed to their number one suspect? because they did. A shed that was a crime scene and a shed that the McKinney's didn't even own. It's on the property beside them and Justin got permission to use that shed. Now the family was told by the liaison that the shed was reseized because there's some stuff missing from it. Detectives didn't know what she was talking about. And if we expand the little circle, Ken has a son named Ken Jr. And they didn't have a clue who Ken Jr. was. Ken Jr. who? I think you know. You know, your fellow OPP officer's daddy? Him. Ken Jr. was also around the weekend Justin was killed. And he posted on Facebook an hour and a half after Justin was reported missing. He didn't post since June of that year, but this day he did. And one hour later, Ken Jr.'s sister, Kate, posted and she hadn't since a month before. Just a curious detail. The family now has someone put in place to support them. And they are making a bit of progress in communication, starting with this meeting, although it's an infuriating one. The detective said they will follow up on the new evidence that the family has for them, namely the audible, etc. even though like, it's not new at all. But let's see what they glean from it and what their answers are on it. Maybe they'll look into Friday or maybe they'll ignore it. What do you think? They did say they won't drop the ball again and it will be properly investigated. Do you believe that? In my opinion, the ball was dropped from the get-go. Wasn't a proper search, no idea about evidence when that's their job is to investigate it. They're not expanding the circle to the household even who has proven to lie and not expanding it further when they haven't had any answers. The list goes on. The question is why? And my question is, was Justin moved? Was the old phone planted? And were they getting advice from a family cop? Be sure to watch my Audible video and following the phone. Please subscribe if you haven't done so already. Please like and please share this out. Let's find the murderer. Thank you so much for watching. See you soon.